Hello and welcome to Empower Learning. This video will be about evaluating limits that end up in determinate forms and specifically talking about Le Hopital's rule and its variations of a theme depending upon what type of indeterminate form we come up with. So if you're watching this video, then you are uh, probably um, at a point let's say if you're trying to review first year calculus or if you are taking a first year calculus course um, that you've studied derivatives um, you've probably already studied limits as well but you haven't evaluated a, a bunch of different type of limits okay and so now what we are going to do is combine our knowledge of what we know about differentiation rules um, as well as what we know about evaluating limits and try to apply that to uh, functions to where if we were to evaluate the limit of it at a particular x value or as x approaches positive or negative infinity, uh, we would get these strange indeterminate forms uh, where in terms of limits, uh, they really don't mean anything. And so in most cases, um, when you first started off evaluating limits, um, you would end up with um, either this, uh, you more than likely the zero over zero case if you just plugged in the x value into the function and, and tried to evaluate the limit that way. Okay? And what you saw in most instances is that in order for you to evaluate the limit properly, um, you needed to rewrite the, the function that you were trying to evaluate the limit of in some way. Okay? And that's essentially what we are going to be doing here um, for some of these limits. Now, uh, where Le Hopital's rule comes in is that uh, sometimes there is no other way to rewrite the actual function that you're dealing with that you need to evaluate the limit for. And so in those instances, uh, what we want to do is we want to instead study the behavior of how fast, um, let's say if we have a quotient of two functions here that makes up a function, we want to study um, how fast the numerator function is increasing or decreasing and compare it to how fast the denominator function is increasing or decreasing. And so uh, with that, that's where the differentiation rules come into play and how Le Hopital's rule is actually useful to us. Okay. Now to, to put this all into perspective here, um, I'm just going to go ahead and mention that all of these indeterminate forms are the ones that we are going to deal with in this particular video. These two that have the stars by them are the ones that we um, normally deal with and it's the it's the form of the indeterminate form that we want to be able to apply Le Hopital's rule. These other indeterminate forms are just going to be indeterminate forms uh, that our functions that we are trying to evaluate the limit of are rewritten in such a way to where they're, they're not conducive to us being able to say it's zero over zero or infinity over infinity whenever we evaluate the limit. So for all of these, we're going to have to rewrite what we have in, in some kind of way to be able to get it back to either a zero over zero or infinity over infinity indeterminate form type situation. Okay. All right. So um, again, to put this into perspective, let's look at this first example here. Now, uh, this example is an example of some of the limits that you uh, probably would have dealt with when you first learn how to evaluate the limit of some function at a particular x value. And so um, in this case, we have um, x squared plus x minus 6 divided by x plus 3, and we want to evaluate the limit of that as x approaches 3 from both, negative 3 from both the left and the right. <clears throat> now, what we want to understand here is that when we say limit, Remember, that is an, a fancy operator in calculus that basically says, I want to study the behavior of this function. And so we're saying, uh, tell me how this function acts uh, both to the left of negative three and to the right of negative three. And I should be able to answer this particular limit with a real number if my y values are, are, are 
approaching the same thing on either side of x equals negative three. Um, if it doesn't do that, then I know that my limit won't exist. Okay. Or if I have a situation where, um, let's say if I had a vertical asymptote, which would not be this situation, um, my graph keeps on going up to positive infinity or down to negative infinity, the closer and closer I get to x equals negative three, uh, then I would either write positive or negative infinity depending upon the situation. Okay. Now in this instance, um, if I just plug in negative three everywhere where I see X here, so if I plugged in negative three here, here, and here, what I would end up seeing here is that I would get a zero divided by zero situation, okay? And so um, <clears throat> depending upon um, where and how you learned um, how to evaluate limits when you first encountered this, you should have been told that um, if you plug in this value here and you get zero over zero, this tells you absolutely positively nothing about the behavior of this function as X approaches negative three. But what it does do is let you know, hey, I got to rewrite this in a certain way. And it turns out here that our numerator uh, can be factored out to X plus three times um, <clears throat> times X minus two. OK. And so because of that, um, we know that, hey, we have this common factor of x plus 3 in the numerator and denominator, and that will reduce to 1. And so when we see this, what we know from a limit perspective, uh, well, sorry, we, what we know from a graphical perspective uh, is that we have a removable discontinuity, um, aka a hole in the graph, uh, because we have um, an x equals 3, um, it's acting like it has an x-intercept and a vertical asymptote all at the same time. And so uh, that is a contradiction of each other, okay? Uh, because you can't have um, an X value that's acting like it's defined for your function at the same place where it's not defined. So you just literally uh, throw that point out and thus it's called a removable discontinuity. Now, the point I'm getting at here is uh, once we reduce these factors to one, what we're left with is this. And what we know is that the behavior of our rational function here is going to act like the behavior of this particular linear function. And thus at this point, we use a direct substitution property to be able to uh, plug in negative three into here and see that the limit actually is um, negative five, okay? And again, what this means um, from a graphical standpoint is that if we looked at the graph of this function here, we would see that at x equals negative three, we would have a hole. Um, and in particular, the actual point on the graph where the hole would be, would be negative three, um, negative five, okay? So if we were drawing this, this graph here, we would have a hole there. And of course, function may look something like this, but we know as x approaches negative three, both from the left and from the right, my y values here will be approaching negative five from either end, okay? Now, um, I went through all of that because we need to have some perspective on um, when we actually have an indeterminate form and how we use L'Hopital's rule and when we shouldn't, okay? Um, in this case, we should because Number one, this value here is not in the domain of this function here. And since um, I have zero over zero, I know that um, that's going to be a Le Hapital's rule case. And you'll see that once we actually go through um, the actual definition of what Le Hapital's rule is. Okay. Now, this other example that I have, uh, this is a case um, where X approaches infinity here. And if we remember from pre-cal, um, whenever we ask um, what is the behavior of our function as X approaches uh, positive infinity and it is a rational function, what we are actually asking about is the end behavior. And in this case, since degree of numerator and denominator are the same, um, what we know is that we have a horizontal asymptote at Y equals whatever the quotient of the leading coefficients are. And of course, leading coefficient of the numerator is one, leading coefficient of the denominator is two. So you see we end up having that. 
And so what I've done here is actually evaluate the limit um, in the old traditional way by utilizing this fact that if I take uh, this rational function here of this type and evaluate it, evaluate the limit as x approaches zero, sorry, x approaches uh, infinity, uh, we will get zero. Okay. So my point here is that these two examples are examples of the types of limits that you should be able to um, evaluate as of right now if you're watching this video. Okay. Um, if you're not familiar with how to evaluate limits like these, uh, then you want to go back and review. And I have um, a few videos, um, one that's called primitive limits, and then another one that's called evaluating limits algebraically uh, that you would want to watch to, to make sure that you're up to speed on this. All right, so let's look at this next example here. And you'll see that in this next example, if I wanted to evaluate the limit of this rational function, um, x raised to 9 minus 1, divided by x raised to 5 minus 1 as x approaches 1 from both the left and the right. Notice that um, I know that if I just plug in 1 here and here, I'm going to get 0 over 0. So what I try to do here is rewrite this in another way uh, to possibly see something that may be in common that I could you know, reduce to 1 or you know something else that would happen to where I would get rid of this whole uh, zero divided by zero outcome for the limit, but notice that in doing that, it still remains the same. Okay. Now, in short, these are the situations where we want to use uh, what's called Le Hapital's rule. Okay. And again, the, the, the purpose of Le Hapital's rule is to say, hey, I'm kind of stuck where I'm not going to be able to rewrite this particular uh, function in another way so that I could uh, really study the behavior of it at this x value or as x approaches pot of a negative infinity. So what I need to do is study um, the rate of change of the numerator versus the denominator of the function. And so that's essentially what Le Hapital's rule is doing. And based upon that, um, we can essentially say that the behavior of our function in these cases when we get either a zero over zero or infinity over infinity um, outcome for the limit, uh, we could study the behavior of the function by just taking the derivative of the numerator and denominator separately and trying to evaluate it that way, okay? Now, there's a little bit more that goes on um, with that, but at the, at the crux of everything, that's essentially what Le Hapital's rule is, okay? And so I'm gonna go ahead and go over that now. So um, the formality, all the formalities of Le Hapital's rule is as follows. And so if we have um, all of these following conditions that are met, okay, then what we are allowed to say is that if I want to evaluate the limit of this function that's made up of the quotient of two other functions, then that's the same as me evaluating the limit of the derivative of the numerator and denominator of that function I'm trying to study the behavior of. Okay. Now, those conditions. Um, I have condition one and two here, but really these just work together. And all that we're saying here is that um, we're considering some um, open interval of x values for where both um, f of x and g of x um, are going to be defined and they are going to be differentiable everywhere except for possibly um, where uh, we have this value here and I'm calling it uh, gamma but that's really um, in terms of the limit that's like really the x equals a that I'm talking about here okay or rather I should say the x equals a that I'm talking about here and here so I'm just calling it gamma in general okay now, the uh, third thing here is that we can't have the derivative of the denominator here be zero, because if we have that, then we have something divided by zero, which technically is undefined if we're thinking about it in terms of numbers. Um, in terms of in terms of limits, uh, that's more than likely going to end us up uh, with the situation where uh, we either have the zero over zero again, or we're going to have some number divided by zero 
and that's either going to go to positive or negative infinity. And we got a different situation. Okay. The fourth thing here is that uh, we want the outcome of both the limit of the numerator and the denominator of our function to either both be zero um, or both be positive or negative infinity. And this doesn't say this here, but it should be equals zero here. Okay. So if we have all four of these conditions in place, then we can simply say, hey, I want to study the behavior of this function, aka evaluate the limit of the function as x approaches a by just evaluating the limit of derivative of numerator, derivative of the number. Okay. So it, it really is just that simple. Now, the interesting thing about Le Habitat's rule is that um, a lot of times, again, we have functions that do the way that they're written, they're not going to be able to utilize Le Habitat's rule directly. So we're going to have to massage the way that those uh, particular functions look so that we can get it into a uh, Le Habitat's rule type of form to where whenever we evaluate the limit, we'll get zero over zero or infinity over infinity to make everything work. Okay. All right. So uh, let's move forward here. All right. So as I've mentioned before, um, Le Habitat's rule is only going to work whenever we have uh, uh, infinity over infinity or zero over zero outcome whenever we evaluate a limit. Okay. However, there, they, there are other indeterminate forms um, that we have to deal with. And like I said before, we want to take those functions that end up having those indeterminate forms when we evaluate the limits and get it back to one of these two. Okay. So what we're going to do right now is quickly look at what some of those other forms are. And I've already showed them to you. Uh, but what I'm going to do is, is show you what they are, as well as a quick prescription for how we're going to deal with the way that, that function looks so that we can um, get it into a form to where we can actually use Le Habitat's rule. OK, now I'm. Um, I'm going to warn you now that I'm not going to uh, spend a whole lot of time going over uh, these particular alternate indeterminate forms. Um, in other words, I'm not going to lecture it to you right now. Um, I'm just going to expose you to it. Um, whenever we get to actual problems like that, I will go back and spend the necessary time uh, to kind of um, explain it in deeper detail uh, because of the fact that as soon as I explain it, we're going to use it. All right, so our case one situation is what we call indeterminate products, and we simply just have um, an outcome of zero times infinity. And so in short, when we have that situation here, um, we just want to rewrite either our f of x function or our g of x function as one over the reciprocal of itself, uh, so that um, when we do that, we're either going to get this infinity over infinity or zero over zero form again. Okay. For case two, uh, this is probably the one that is uh, the hardest to deal with just because um, there is no one silver bullet type thing that we can do to tell you, hey, if you do this one thing, you'll always get it back in the form that you need. OK, um, so for here, uh, this is the infinity minus infinity indeterminate form. And this is an indeterminate form because uh, remember that infinity is a concept, not a number. And so who's to say that this infinity is bigger or smaller than this infinity? OK, um, we don't know that because we don't know how much infinity is. So that's why we have to let it be an indeterminate form. OK, so in short, whenever we have this type of indeterminate form, there is a, a myriad of things that we could do. Uh, the top three candidates here are just um, we want to factor out a common factor in both um, f of x and g of x. And hopefully by uh, being able to factor out, you know, a common factor or reduce to one and what would be left would get rid of this infinity minus infinity case. Uh, sometimes we can rationalize denominators and sometimes we can find uh, common denominators. OK. Um, another thing that I have not mentioned um, which is something that you have seen before or you should have seen before if you're at this point uh, 
Um, if you remember, especially if you watch my videos, this whole concept of using a conjugate radical. Okay. And so uh, really, this is part of this prescription here, but um, the conjugate radical technique for some of the, the limits to where you would need to use that, um, that's actually something that comes from the case two indeterminate form. Okay. All right. So for case three, tells us how to deal with indeterminate powers. And so um, out of all of these, uh, this is the one that is most process heavy, uh, but it is kind of straightforward on what it is that you do. Um, the bad thing about this particular form is that, of course, you, you got relatively a lot of steps to do, okay? And uh, we can skip this part here. Uh, the main part is what do we need to do to get ourselves in a position to evaluate the limit using the Hopital's rule, okay? So in short, um, what this says is, is that we're going to let um, whatever our function is, is going to be a function raised to another function. We're going to let that be y. And instead of trying to evaluate the limit of y directly, we're going to evaluate the limit of natural log of y, okay? And by doing that, that forces us to be in this uh, zero times infinity uh, or indeterminate product form. And of course, we know how to deal with the indeterminate products. Uh, we just let either the, uh, in this case, g of x function or natural log of f of x function, we write that as one over the reciprocal of itself. At that point, uh, we are, we have it in a form that will automatically be a zero over zero or infinity over infinity, as I state here. And then you just, uh, apply the Hopital's rule. Once you find out what the limit of natural log of y is, you just use the fact um, that y is equal to e raised to the natural log of y. You use that fact um, and we also use um, one of the one of the uh, basic fact theorems uh, from back when we studied continuity to basically take uh, this limit operator here, whenever we evaluate this, and slide it into the exponent, okay? So in short, once we get our answer uh, for this, our limit is going to be just e raised to the whatever this answer is, okay? And that's a short way to put it. All right, so let's uh, look at several examples here. All right, so for this first example, this should look familiar. Um, we know that if I was just to plug in one into the uh, X in the numerator and denominator, I would just get zero over zero. So this means I would need to use La Habitale's rule. Okay. And so what this means now is since I need to use La Habitale's rule, I need to take the derivative of the numerator and the denominator separately. Okay. So I'm going to erase what I have here so that I can write this out properly. Okay. Now, when doing La Hopital's rule, and, and we know that we got to do it, um, the proper way to notate that is to write an equal sign with an H on top. Okay. Um, if you don't do that, then you're not communicating to your reader um, that you're actually using that particular uh, rule to be able to evaluate the limit. And um, if you don't use it, it is incorrect, okay? Um, I know some people just try to ignore it, but um, proper notation, you need to have this H here on top of the equal sign uh, to notate that you're actually doing uh, La Hopital's rule, okay? All right, so now with that, we'll just take the derivative of the numerator and denominator separately. Of course, the derivative of the numerator is just 9x raised to the 8 of the denominator, 5x raised to the 4. And of course, this 9 and 5, we could factor that out. Have limit as x approaches 1 of what's left, which is x raised to the 8 divided by x raised to the 4 would be the result of x raised to the 4. And from here, it's pretty easy. Um, one is in the domain of x raised to the four, so I can just plug in one, and I see that my limit just ends up being nine over five, okay? 
And um, again, what this means conceptually is that if I was to look at a graph of this function here, it would have a hole in it. And the point location of where that hole would be would be at the point um, one nine fifths. Okay. And I know that because I had that zero over zero outcome whenever I plugged in one into. Okay. All right. So let's look at this next example. Um, this one I've already worked out here. So um, if you notice, we are looking at the behavior of this function, which is cosine divided by one minus sine x. Um, and we're looking at that from um, as x approaches pi over two from the right. Okay, if I just plug in pi over two, um, everywhere where I see x, I'm going to get the indeterminate form zero divided by zero. So this lets me know that I am using the, uh, I'm going to be using uh, Le Hopital's rule because this is an indeterminate form for that. So I rewrite my limit, make sure that I use the notation here, and then take the derivative of the numerator and denominator. Once I'm done, then you see that um, essentially, uh, what I need to do is uh, simplify what I can here. And um, even though I didn't do this here, uh, notice that all of this is just tangent of x. Okay. And if we look at the graph of tangent of x as x approaches pi over 2 from the right, um, that graph there, if I was looking at tangent, okay. And let's see, yeah, so if I had this tangent would look something like this, where this is x is equal to negative pi over 2. And this would be x is equal to 3 pi over 2. This would be pi, go like this. <clears throat> and so we see here that as x approaches pi over 2 from the right, my y values keep getting more and more and more and more negative, and thus why we have negative infinity for that answer there, okay? And so notice here that um, I have this, and then automatically I just end up with a negative sign, okay? That is because of the fact that I realize that this is actually a tangent function here, okay? Evaluated at pi over two coming from um, the the right side of pi over 2, okay? And so I say this to say that um, in evaluating limits, um, although we're trying to do these limits computationally, you still have to know what the graphs of your basic functions look like. And, um, and I'm talking about trig functions too as being some of the basic ones you need to know what it looks like, okay? Um, you can very easily answer this incorrectly and answer it with a positive infinity um, just thinking that anything divided by zero is just going to be positive infinity. But you have to know the behavior of how the, the graph acts. And so there is no substitute for that. You just got to know it. Okay. All right. So for our next example here, um, we always uh, try out to see, hey, are we going to have this indeterminate form first before we try to use Le Hopital's rule? Okay. And uh, the reason why I state that is because I find um, personally from from what I see that Le Hopital's rule is probably the most abused rule um, out of all the ones <laughs> when it comes to evaluating limits, uh, because I've, I've just noticed, noticed that most students, they'll just start using Le Hopital's rule uh, regardless of whether um, that function meets the conditions for Le Hopital's rule or not. Okay, And sometimes they make the problem harder than they have to be. So for this situation here, we're actually going to verify that we need to use the Hopital's rule before we use it, okay? So here, I'm just going to plug in, it's pi over two. And of course, um, cosecant here is the same as the reciprocal of sine. So just to make life a little easier, um, I'm going to do it this way. And notice here that we know sine of pi over two is just one. And here, sine of pi over 2 is just 1. And so you see here that this outcome is 0. Now, 
Does this meet the conditions for the Hopital's rule? No, it doesn't. Okay. We didn't have zero over zero. We didn't have infinity over infinity. Okay. And this shows you here that we actually do need to test to see whether we uh, actually have a situation for the Hopital's rule or not, because we actually found the answer that we were looking for. Okay. We were actually able to evaluate the limit of this function just by plugging in pi over two because pi over two is in the domain of this particular function that we're dealing with, okay? So again, this is another example of why we actually want to verify if uh, what type of indeterminate form that we have before we just start jumping in and trying to use L'Hopital's rule or, or something else, okay? All right, so let's move to our next example. All right, so for this next example here, um, Again, we just want to plug in zero everywhere where we can. And so I'm going to come up here and do that just to verify that we uh, need to use the Hopital's rule here. So if I go and plug in zero everywhere where I see X, Then notice here what we get is natural log of zero divided by natural log of zero. And if you know anything about the graph of natural log of x, um, we know that on the left side of the y-axis, uh, or on the left side of x equals zero, the graph is undefined. Um, on x equals zero, we have a vertical asymptote, so it's also undefined. And to the right of it, and I'll just go ahead and draw what the graph looks like here. So our graph looks like this. So this is our vertical asymptote here at x equals zero. So we see as x approaches zero from the right, the y values get more and more negative. So we have negative infinity over negative infinity, which ends up just being infinity over infinity, okay? And again, La Hapital's rule is needed here. So because of that, uh, we go ahead and say, all right, we're going to use the Hopital's rule. And so this means that we're going to have to take the derivative of the numerator and denominator separately and then evaluate. So I'm going to get rid of this. If we take the derivative of the numerator here, uh, notice that we are going to use a chain rule. So the derivative of natural log of all that's on the inside is just going to be 1 over uh, x squared plus 7x times um, we take the derivative of the inside function that's just going to be 2x plus 7 and then all that is divided by the derivative of natural log of x which is just 1 over x okay and then from there um, what we do is just try to clean up simplify as much as we can and then uh, move forward from there so if I look at this this is just going to be 2x plus 7 divided by x squared plus 7x times x over 1. And if you notice here, our denominator, uh, we could go ahead and factor out greatest common factor of x here. Okay. So now that we have that in place, we know that these x's reduce to 1. And our result here is going to be limit as x approaches 0 from the right of 2x plus 7 divided by x plus 7. And so here, if I plug in 0 into the denominator here, I notice that I'm not going to get 0 again. So that means that uh, well, Hopital's rule is over with. So now I can just use what I have to be able to evaluate the limit. And I see that my numerator and denominator both end up being 7, and my result ends up being 1 here. So we see that the behavior of this function as x approaches 0 from the right is just going to end up being 
one. All right, so let's look at our next example. Okay, so the next problem that we have, um, example E here, is going to be a case one type uh, situation uh, for the indeterminate form, okay? So in other words, um, if I was just to plug in zero um, in for X, I am not going to get um, a situation where I have zero over zero or infinity over infinity um, just as it looks, okay? So I'll go ahead and show you that. Of course, here, this would be 3 pi over 2 minus 0. And it turns out here that um, secant of 3 pi over 2 um, actually has a vertical asymptote there. So uh, we would end up having 0 times infinity. And of course, this is um, case 1 in determinant form. Okay. Now, what this means is that we need to either rewrite x or secant of 3 pi over 2 minus x um, as 1 over the reciprocal of itself. Okay. Now, in my opinion, I think it's easier to deal with this to rewrite that as 1 over the reciprocal of itself. And so I'm going to go ahead and do that. I'm just going to uh, rewrite what I have here. And now um, what I'm going to do is rewrite secant as 1 over 1 over cosine. Okay. Go ahead and write that. Oh, sorry. Not 1 over 1 over cosine, but 1 over cosine. So we would just have x here. And in the denominator, I would just have cosine of 3 pi over 2 minus that. Okay. So we are essentially just rewriting secant as 1 over the reciprocal of secant, which is cosine. Okay. And so from here, we know that uh, we're automatically going to have this in either an infinity over infinity or zero over zero form. Um, to be specific about it, we're going, this is going to end up being a zero over zero form here because if I plug in zero in for x here, we get zero. And of course, if I plug in zero in for x here, I know that cosine of three pi over two is zero. Okay. So because we know that we automatically have it in that form, then we're going to do the H here to let us know that we're doing La Hapital's rule. And we're going to take the derivative of the numerator and denominator separate. Okay. Now, just as a reminder to say, well, why did we rewrite this again? If we come here, remember that case one said that if we have this type situation happen, then we had to choose on whether we're going to rewrite F or G as one over the reciprocal of itself, okay? We chose to rewrite this as um, one divided by the reciprocal of itself, okay? And of course, secant, the reciprocal of secant is cosine. So we just said one divided by cosine is gonna be the same thing as secant, okay? So uh, that's what we did there. And so now, when I take the derivative of the numerator with respect to x, that's just going to be one. If I take the derivative of the denominator, that's going to be a minus sign of 3 pi over 2 minus x. And since we have an inside function here, we'll need to do the chain rule. And the derivative of the inside function is just going to be minus 1. And so uh, from here, uh, we know that this negative times this negative is a positive. So we'll go ahead and notate that. So this would be positive here, positive there. And then the last thing uh, that we can do at this point is we just need to plug in zero, see what we get, okay? So if I plug in zero um, here, then I'm just going to get sine of three pi over two. And if you remember, sine of 3 pi over 2 is just going to be negative 1, okay? 
until our final result here just ends up being a minus one. And so that would be uh, what our limit for this particular uh, function would be. All right, so let's move on to example F. So for example F, you see I've already worked it out. Uh, first thing I did here, again, is plug in zero everywhere where I see X. And I verify that what I'm dealing with here um, is a zero over zero case. So I'm going to use L'Hopital's rule directly, which just means I need to take the derivative of the numerator and the denominator separately and then evaluate the limit again. So if we take the derivative of cosine of mx, where m is a constant, uh, that's just going to be minus sine of mx times derivative of the inside function, which is m. Uh, kind of repeat the process here, but instead of m, it's n. Let me see what we get here. And then, of course, the derivative of x squared is just 2x. So from that, um, I do some rearranging, algebraically speaking, get to this point. And then um, after I rearrange to make everything look as nice as I could possibly uh, make it, I plug in 0 in for x again to see if I can evaluate it. Um, and I'm guessing that I can because I no longer have the problem uh, of uh, being in my denominator here of having the x there because of the fact that here notice that we did La Hypital's rule again okay so we took x and we got it into this form uh, we looked here and we said okay I got I'm, I'm going to have zero here in the denominator will I have zero in the numerator as well and of course um, anytime you multiply anything times zero, you get zero. And you have, of course, sine of zero inside of here and inside of here. So you're going to e essentially have zero over zero again. So we had to do L'Hopital's rule again. And then once we got to here, then that's when we could you know, do our little rearranging if we need to. Since we don't have um, x in the denominator anymore, we don't have the issue of possibly getting something divided by zero. So we can just go ahead and plug in what we need to, okay? So we do that, and we know that um, cosine of zero is just going to be one in both instances here. So we just end up with a minus m squared plus n squared. And of course, n and m are both constants. So what we end up having here for this family of functions is that we want to study the behavior of this family of functions as x approaches zero from both the left and the right. As long as we know what m and n are, we know um, what y value this particular function is going to approach, even though it won't be defined there um, at x equals zero, but we'll know what y value it will approach um, as x approaches zero from both the left and the right. Now, put that in uh, layman's terms, we know that our hole um, that's going to be in our in the graph of this function is going to be at the point 0, n squared minus m squared divided by 2, okay? And so that's conceptually uh, what that means whenever we evaluate that limit. All right, so let's move on to the next example. All right, so in our next example, um, we are looking at a limit to where uh, we would have a case three type situation, okay? And so the case three type situation uh, would be the situation where we have indeterminate powers. And so let's go back and uh, review what the prescription for a case three type situation um, would recommend. So for the case three type situation, uh, this happens whenever we have the limit as x approaches um, a uh, of some function raised to another function, and we either get this 0 raised to the 0, infinity raised to the 0, or 1 raised to the plus or minus infinity here. And so um, the main thing to remember is that the first thing that we need to do is not try to solve for the limit of our function f of x raised to the g of x directly. Uh, we just let that equal y, and we say, well, let's take the natural log of both sides 
of this equation here and we try to find out what the limit of natural log of y is okay and so we'll naturally see that um, the limit of natural log of y will always be in this form and this form here will always give us an indeterminate product okay um, it may be infinity times zero or zero times infinity really doesn't matter it's an indeterminate product um, after we do that, we know that indeterminate products, we have to choose whether we want to rewrite g of x or natural log of f of x as one over the reciprocal of itself. Okay, And so um, you can choose which form you want to do it in. Um, I, will all, I would always take the function that is easiest to deal with in its one over the reciprocal form. And then from there, you automatically have this into... Um, uh, infinity over infinity or zero over zero form so you can just take the derivative of the numerator and denominator separately evaluate the limit see what you get okay so that's um, the process that I'm going to be doing here uh, that's basically the steps that are going to be followed here so our function is x raised to the 9 divided by 1 minus x I let y equal that and then I take the natural log of both sides, okay? And notice here, whenever I take the natural log of both sides here, that since this is in the exponent, I can pull it out in front of the natural log on the right-hand side of this equation here. So that's how I get the nine divided by one minus X out in front here on the right side, okay? From that point, um, it will be easier, in my opinion, to deal with one divided by the reciprocal of this rational expression here than to deal with one divided by the reciprocal of natural log of x. So um, I rewrite this where I make this basically just one over one minus x divided by nine, okay? Now, once we have this um, in this form here, um, we know that this form is automatically going to either give us an, a zero over zero or infinity over infinity case, okay? Um, if I'm plugging in one into here, uh, it's going to give me the zero over zero in this particular case here. So now that I have a form in which I could rewrite um, natural log of the actual function that I'm dealing with, I say, let's find the limit of natural log of y put it into the form that's going to allow me to be able to do La Hapital's rule. And then I take the derivative of the numerator and the denominator separately. Once that's done, then I rearrange algebraically as much as I can. And then I notice here that if I just plug in one for X, life is easy. And I have what the limit of natural log of Y is. Okay. So I restate that the limit of natural log of y as x approaches one from the right is going to be minus nine. But remember that last step that we said here, and I'll scroll back down. So here we have to recall that y is equal to e raised in the natural log of y. So we're, we are exploiting our logarithm properties um, to help us out. And so um, once we're here, then we just replace y with e raised to the natural log of y. And then um, per some basic fact corollaries, um, after we study continuity here, um, we are able to take our limit operator and slide it in the uh, exponent here, okay? And so um, essentially our answer to this question is literally just going to be um, e raised to the whatever we got here, okay? And so, um, of course, all of this is just minus 9, so our answer is just e raised to the minus 9. Now, um, as a side note, um, I, I know that you kept on hearing me talk about, um, because of some basic facts after we studied uh, continuity, that I'm able to take this limit operator here and slide it in the exponent, okay? So I'm, I'm gonna go back and review actually what it is that I'm talking about, um, because if you have been watching my videos, 
I mentioned um, in these in, in the video on continuity or videos on continuity uh, that we were going to get to a point to where uh, one of those theorems that we were going to use and it wasn't going to be real important for us to know it until this point. And so we're here now. So I wanted to, to review that just to bring that back to your memory before we move forward with other examples. All right. So um, when we first talk about continuity in a first in a in a first year calculus course, um, we define continuity um, of a function at a single x value or at a single point. Sometimes it's called um, this way. So we say that a function is continuous at a number a if all three of these characteristics are true about the function. First, uh, the function has to be defined. Oops, sorry, the function has to be defined at x equals a. Um, the limit has to exist at x equals a, meaning that the limit has to equal a real number and that the number that I get from here and the number that I get from here both have to be the same. Okay. And so uh, from that, um, I went over what continuity from the right and continuity from the left was. And then uh, we talked about continuity on an interval. So we saw what um, continuity is at a particular point. We saw what continuity is from the right, from the left, and on an interval, we saw what that actually looks like. And we also learned examples of what discontinuities looked like. Okay. Um, we saw um, what happens in situations where we would violate one of the three uh, conditions of the continuity definition, and so or the continuity criterion sometimes is called. And then uh, from here, we had some theorems that came as a direct consequence of the continuity definition. Okay, and we had five in all. So the first three are pretty self-explanatory. Um, we had if I got two functions and I know that they're continuous at some value x equals a, then I know that the sum, difference, product, quotient, and constant multiple, non-zero constant multiple. Uh, will all be continuous as well over the same interval of x values. Um, we also mentioned that um, any polynomial or rational function is continuous anywhere in its domain and polynomials are continuous for all real numbers so that's everywhere. Uh, we extended this whole concept of continuity of a function anywhere that's in its domain to all of the basic type of functions that we deal with um, in pre-cal. Uh, which is polynomials, trig functions, so on and so forth. And so from here, we had these other two theorems uh, that I talked about. Okay. And so um, the theorem that we are using in the case three situation is this theorem number four. Okay. And so notice that this tells you how to take the limit of a composition function. And what it says here is that you could. Um, that the limit of this composition function as x approaches a is b if we know that the limit as x approaches a of the inside function is just going to be this. And so notice how what we did here is we took this limit operator and we slid it into the inside function. Okay. And so um, I nicknamed this particular theorem. This is looking. Um, um, continuous composite function um, looking from the outside function to the inside or looking from the outside in short and notice here for this example that when we did this we took our limit operator and we slid it to the inside function which was that natural log of y okay so that theorem number four becomes important here uh, because without that uh, we would not know how to deal with evaluating um, the limit of this composition function that we had. Okay. And so again, it is theorem number four here that allows us to be able to make that last step in case three um, that makes everything work beautifully here. Okay. All right. So let's get back to some more examples. All right. So for this next example here, um, I, I want to kind of warn you ahead of time that we want to make life as easy for ourselves as possible. 
um, we're still going to plug in A everywhere where we see X to evaluate what's going on here. Uh, but we want to utilize some of our uh, limit rules or, or limit uh, properties uh, or limit laws. That's probably the, the more formal way to say it uh, to make actually evaluating this limit as easy as possible. Um, if we don't think about that up front, um, this limit can be very tedious to do. Um, but all for nothing. Okay. All right. So first thing, let's go ahead and verify what type of indeterminate form we're going to be dealing with. So I have cosine of a times natural log of a minus a over natural log of e raised to the a minus e raised to the a. And so what you see we have here is essentially um, some constant cosine of a times limit um, sorry natural log of zero divided by natural log of zero we both know that both of these end up being negative infinity so what we just have here is cosine of a times an infinity over infinity case okay so we know that this fits uh, the condition for the Hopital's rule um, even though we have this constant out here, uh, this part really doesn't matter, okay? And I'll show you why. So if we were actually evaluating um, the limit of this function here, I'm just going to come down here and do equals. Notice that here I could rewrite this limit as limit as x approaches a from the right of cosine of x times limit as x approaches a from the right of natural log of x minus a and let's fix that oh. natural log of x minus a over natural log of e raised to the x minus e raised to the a Okay. And so now this infinity over infinity part only comes from this second limit here. And of course, um, since cosine of x is going to be uh, defined for all real numbers, I can evaluate the limit by using the direct substitution property, um, essentially just plugging in a here. And I know that all of this is just going to be cosine of a. And that's just going to be some constant value. So I don't worry about it, okay? So next I say, um, I'm going to use Le Hopital's rule, write my constant out, and then afterwards um, I'm going to take the derivative of the numerator and denominator separately for my limit here. Okay, so the derivative of the numerator will just be one divided by x minus a, times derivative of the inside function, which would just be one. Do the same thing in the denominator here. So be one divided by e raised to the x minus e raised to the a. And then multiply that times the derivative of the inside function. Um, this e raised to the a is just a constant. So the derivative of that part would be zero. The derivative of e raised to the x would just be itself, e raised to the x. Okay. So from there, um, we will just continue on evaluating. So here we'll have cosine of a times limit as x approaches a from the right. And I'm just going to have 1 over x minus a times the reciprocal of what we got going on here. And notice here that in this form, if I plug in a for x here, I'm going to have zero. And if I plug in a here for x, I'm going to have e raised to a minus itself. So I'm still going to have a zero over zero case here. 
So that lets me know that I am going to have to use Le Hopital's rule again, which means I need to take the derivative of the numerator and denominator again. Okay. So I have cosine of a times limit as x approaches a from the right. And now I need to take the derivative of the numerator here. Uh, the derivative of the numerator, derivative of e to the x is just itself, minus e raised to the a, that's a constant, so the derivative of any constant is zero. In the denominator, I have a product of two functions, so I'm going to have to use the product rule. So the derivative of the first function, um, x minus a, is just going to be 1. And then that's times um, e to the x plus x minus a times derivative of the second function, which again is just itself. Okay. So um, if we keep on here, notice that the numerator and denominator of our resulting function inside of our limit here both have a common factor of e raised to the x. So cosine of a times limit as x approaches a from the right. Got e raised to the x here, and that's just going to be 1 e raised to the x, and I'm going to have 1 plus x minus a. And of course, um, those e raised to the x terms uh, or factors here, they will reduce to 1. And all I'm going to have left, whoa, what happened? <laughs> Yeah, hold on a second. I'm going to pause this because something's happening. All right, so I'm hoping that whatever was happening got fixed here. So we have cosine of a times. And so now, since I have these e raised to the x is reduced to 1, I can literally just plug in a everywhere where I see x. And so here this will give me 1 divided by 1 plus a minus a. And of course, um, all of what I'm seeing here is just going to be 1. So my result just ends up being cosine of a for my final answer, where again, cosine of a is just some constant number. All right, let's look at uh, the next example. So this next example that we have, um, if you notice, we have the difference of 1 minus natural log of x uh, divided by x minus 5, sorry, 1 divided by natural log of x minus 5, um, and 1 divided by x minus 6. If we study the behavior of that as x approaches 6 from the right, um, we see that if we just try to plug in 6, uh, we end up getting an infinity over infinity case here. Okay, And so this is an example of one of the many uh, types of situations that you'll get from a case two situation. So um, I'm going to look at what case two recommends. And remember, if this was the one where I said that we could do a lot of different things. Um, and the, the top three here would be factor out a common factor um, in both the numerator and denominator. Well, sorry, not numerator and denominator, but both F and G. Um, what what else we could do is rationalize the denominators or find a common denominator in between F and G. And so this is going to be the, um, so the probably the suggestion that we're going to take for this particular example here. Um, we're going to find a common denominator um, in between F of X and G of X. So um, finding a common denominator uh, amongst these um, of course, we'll just multiply numerator and denominator here by x minus 6, multiply numerator and denominator here by natural log of x minus 5. And so uh, this is what we end up with when we do that. Um, of course, um, once we do that, 
plug in six again, we see that we now have that indeterminate form that one of the two indeterminate forms that we want to apply L'Hopital's rule. So uh, we just rewrite our limit and say, now that this fits the zero divided by zero indeterminate form situation, we notate to our reader that we're doing L'Hopital's rule and then take the derivative of the numerator and denominator separately. Um, and again, I cannot stress this enough. It is the numerator and denominator separately. We are not doing the quotient rule here. We're, you, we're doing the derivative of the numerator function and the denominator function separately, okay? All right, so once um, we do all of that, uh, and of course in the denominator, since I have a product of two functions, I have to use the product rule here. So that's why this looks a little longer than what it looked like in the numerator. Um, we do some algebraic manipulation to uh, try to see, hey, uh, are we going to have to do the Hypertals rule again, or are we going to get something to where we can just evaluate the limit at that point? So for these two steps here, um, I algebraically try to simplify as much as I can and then evaluate the limit again. And you see that even in doing it again, I end up with a zero over zero again. So what this tells me is that I'm going to have to apply the L'Hopital's rule one more time, okay? So um, I take what I currently have here, notate to my reader that I'm going to use L'Hopital's rule, take derivative of numerator and denominator again, okay? And of course, um, I understand that this is starting to get a little messy, but you know, this is how these types of limits are. Um, for the numerator, relatively easy to do as far as the derivative is concerned. Uh, for the denominator, this first term, uh, just use the chain rule. Uh, for the second term, use the quotient rule. And of course, once all that's done, um, simplify what we can here. And then we uh, plug in six again, and we notice that this time we do not have um, zero in the denominator. Um, so we know that we're not going to have to use L'Hopital's rule anymore. And it turns out that all this just becomes one hat. So uh, we know that the behavior of the original function that we had, um, let's see, way up here, the behavior of this function um, as x approaches 6 from the right um, is just going to be approaching a y value of one hat. All right, so let's look at the next example. All right, so uh, the next example is another case three type situation here. And um, if we go back and look, case three again, this is the one where we had the indeterminate powers. And so uh, either it's going to be zero raised to the zero, infinity raised to the zero, or zero raised to the plus or minus infinity. And remember, we had our four steps here. Uh, the main thing that we want to remember is that we do not want to solve for, uh, well, evaluate the limit of y directly. We want to evaluate the limit of natural log of y. So uh, we let y equal f of x raised to g of x, take natural log of both sides here, and then we're going to rewrite what this looks like to either this form or this form. And of course, that gets us into the L'Hopital's rule form that we need. And then from that point, um, we figure out what natural, uh, what the limit of natural log of y is, and then just use uh, the fact that e raised to the natural log of y is y, and that theorem number four that I showed you earlier um, about evaluating the limit of a composition function to be able to simply say that the limit of y is just going to be the is just going to be e raised to the limit of natural log of y okay and so um, here we notice that if we plug in zero into the given function that we have which is tangent of 2x all that raised to the x we get a zero over zero case so we let tangent of 2x raised to the x um, equal y. We take the natural log of both sides. 
And of course, in taking the natural log of both sides here again, I'm just going to write it out. This is in the exponent, so that can be pulled out in front of the natural log on the right hand side of the equation. And then again, x is much easier to write as 1 over the reciprocal of itself than natural log of tangent of 2x. So notice that I decide to just write this as 1 divided by the reciprocal of x. From there, I automatically know that it is in, um, in this case, an infinity over infinity form. Um, really doesn't matter whether it's 0 over 0 or infinity over infinity. We know we can use L'Hopital's rule. So um, in this form, we use L'Hopital's rule. And of course, remember, we have to denote that. And then we take the derivative of the numerator and denominator separately. Um, we try to simplify what we can, uh, work it out. But unfortunately here, once we get to this point and we evaluate it with zero again, we see that we have zero over zero one more time. So that means we're going to have to do the Hopital's rule one more time. And so uh, once we actually do that, um, we take what we have here, apply the Hopital's rule one more time, take the derivative of the numerator and denominator separately. And of course in the numerator, I will be doing a combination of the product rule and the chain rule. In the denominator, I'll just be doing the chain rule. And of course, from that point, uh, if you keep looking onward here, um, what you'll see is that once we do the derivative of the numerator and the denominator separately, um, I'm trying to get things written in such a way to where um, I can actually evaluate um, each term. Um, I want, I would like to have things in terms of either secant or tangent because I know tangent of zero is zero and I know secant of zero is going to be one. Okay. And so uh, once I get it into that form, um, just plug in zero everywhere where I see x and you notice that the numerator ends up giving me zero denominator ends up giving me one. And so my result here just ends up being zero. So what does that mean? So at this point, what that means is that, um, and I'll just write it up here, the limit as X approaches zero from the right of natural log of Y is zero. Thus the limit of y, which is what I actually want, is just going to be e raised to natural log, um, e raised to the limit of natural log of y as x approaches zero. And of course, all of this here is just zero. Okay, so all of this is just zero. So um, e raised to zero just ends up being one. All right, so let's look at um, our next example. All right, so this next and final example here is another case two type situation. And so if we uh, go back to uh, what I was saying with case two, I'll just scroll back here. Remember, this was the one that, uh, depending upon what we had to deal with, had a different things that we could possibly do. And I told you that uh, I told you earlier in the video that one of the things that we don't see explicitly listed here, but it is implied, is using the conjugate radical technique. OK. And um, here that is under this uh, rationalization part here. OK. So it's a variation of the theme of that. So if you look here. <coughs> Um, the conjugate radical theorem, I'm oh, sorry, conjugate radical technique, rather, uh, just basically says we are going to um, rewrite this by basically multiplying it by one, but we're going to make one look like the conjugate of the numerator here, okay? And the idea is that um, anytime we have um, square root of something times itself is just going to be whatever uh, the, the radicand is or whatever the expression under the radical is here. So if I'm able to do that, 
course, uh, my denominator here, uh, let me get rid of what I'm drawing here. So my denominator, if I multiply this times all of that, of course, is just going to be uh, square root of x squared plus x. Um, and then, of course, um, outside of the square root sign is just going to be plus x. In the numerator, though, notice that I have uh, basically a minus b times a plus b. And we know that that's just a squared minus b squared. And of course, anytime we take the square of the square root of something, it's just going to be what's under the radical. Okay. And so uh, for this particular situation here, um, let's see, I don't know why I have the these absolute value sign bars here. Um, because this is not this situation. So, so here, yeah, I just need to write that as regular parentheses. And of course, I can drop them in the next step. And I see that this x squared minus x squared cancels to zero. And now what I have is this situation here. Now, notice that all that I'm doing here, I'm strategically trying to work on what this looks like before I start to um, try to actually evaluate the limit of it, okay? Um, it is not okay for you to just work on this and then once you get to this point, just plug in a number and be done. You actually have to show the limit notation. There is no option with that. You have to do it. If you don't, it's incorrect notation. It's kind of like speaking incorrect English, okay? Um, you can do it, but it's not correct, okay? All right, so anyway, so once we get to this point here, um, we notice that we still have a problem. And that problem here is I still need to, and, and I know this is technically not possible, but we're going to do it here. We're going to plug in infinity. And if I do that, this is still going to give me an infinity over infinity case. Okay, so I still have to find a way to rewrite this uh, so that I don't get this infinity over infinity case. And it turns out here that if I was to multiply this um, expression here by one, but I make one look like. Um, now let me just write it over here. If I make one look like one over x squared divided by one over x squared and take the square root of that, then it would work, okay? And note here that anytime I have um, something divided by something else and I take the square root of it, it's just going to be the square root of the numerator divided by the square root of the denominator, okay? So here I know that Getting rid of all of this. I know that what I actually have here is square root of this, square root of that. Now, in the numerator part, which is here, I know that um, because I'm assuming here that x is going to be greater than zero, and I know that because of what I got going on here, um, that if, and, and I also know that because here x is approaching positive infinity. So I'm not, I'm not considering any negative values for x anyway. So I could rewrite square root of one over x squared as just one over x. And of course that works out nice in the numerator here just to give me one. In the denominator, I need to keep this looking as square root of one over x squared so that I can legally go in and multiply uh, this 1 over x squared by this x squared plus x under the radical of that first term, okay? So that's why um, I left the denominator as square root of 1 over x squared, whereas I left the numerator, uh, while well, I changed the numerator to 1 over x. So once we do that, we see that uh, if I distribute this to both terms, I know that um, this first term here, I'm basically going to be uh, dividing all of these expressions under the radical in the first term in the denominator by x squared. And remember here that this x being multiplied times square root of 1 over x squared, that's just like saying x times 1 over x, and that's just 1, okay? 
And so in this form, this form will be the form that I need to have it in so that when I plug in infinity here for x, I don't get zero or infinity in the denominator. Okay. And so uh, basically what all this means is that I did all this work here to rewrite this particular function in this form so that I could really uh, study the behavior, uh, in this case, the end behavior of my function as x approaches infinity here, okay? So um, I see that in this case, um, this square root of x squared plus x, um, all that minus x, the behavior of this function acts just like the behavior of this function as x approaches infinity. And then, of course, from there, um, I get kind of formal with the limits. Uh, main thing that you can do once you have this particular step here is just plug in infinity for x. And then, of course, um, 1 divided by infinity, the limit of that goes to 0. And we see once we're done evaluating everything, that the answer ends up being 1 half. And so what this tells us um, from a conceptual standpoint is that this function that we're dealing with, uh, we're asking for the end behavior of it. And if the end behavior ends up equaling a real number, what we are essentially saying here, I'm going to erase this too, is that since our answer here is one half, what we're saying here is that we have a horizontal asymptote um, on the graph of this function at y equals one half. Okay. So whatever that function looks like here, we know that for values of um, x that go on to infinity, either this function is kind of rolling in like this, or it may be coming in like this, depending upon um, if the function lies either below or above um, that horizontal asymptote as it starts to get closest to it. All right, and so with this, this concludes um, this video on indeterminate forms and also applying Lahapital's rule and its various um, alternative indeterminate forms that arise from that. Um, I hope the amount of examples was enough to kind of give you a good idea of the kind of things that you'll see. And I hope that um, the way I've explained this has, has made it clear on how to approach these types of limits. Take care.